Ross Bowman Podcast. You better less. Welcome back to the Ross Bolin Podcast, otherwise known as RBP, presented by Bolin Media. I am your host, Ross Bolin, back again with your co-host, as always, Chris Coles Colson. Christopher, you and I were discussing off mic before the show started. We were. Um, probably. I don't know what you're about to say, but probably. Sea shanties. Ah, uh, yes. I wanted to quickly explain something. You may have seen sea shanties, like the word sea, like the ocean, S-E-A. Shanties, like damn you people, go back to your shanties, S-H-A-N-T-I-E-S. You may have seen this trending on the internet recently, last few weeks, mostly TikTok, bled over into Instagram and Twitter now. Uh, it, look, this is, this is the kids, this is Coles, this is Gen Z. If you're older, if you're like above 28, you're probably very confused about like what even is a sea shanty. So we're going to play you one now. Was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was a belly of tea. The winds blew up her bow, the turn up below my belly boys blow. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. She had not been two weeks from shore when down on her a right whale bore. The captain called all hands and swore he'd take, take that, that whale, whale and tow. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea. Okay, Cole, that, that sound familiar to you? Yes, and that was just excellent. Let me just say, absolutely fucking beautiful. Right I'm gonna give bat. I'm gonna give you a little story about my first experience with sea shanties. Okay. Now, technically, probably not my first experience. <laughs> I'm sure I watched, you know, Peter Pan has them in the Disney version or whatever, but it's like pirate songs. You know, songs that like a pirate would sing on a boat. My first experience was in Assassin's Creed Black Sail or whatever that game was called. The pirate game that Assassin's Creed made out, a video game. <clears throat> Nerd. <clears throat> and the songs in that game, much like all the sea shanties we now see going viral on the social medias, low-key get you hyped. Straight bangers, if so I may say. It's a weird thing, like, you, the first time you get on the pirate ship in that game and, like, your sailors all start singing together. It's yeah. a large group of men yes. singing a cappella, a sea shanty. Yes. Which is like a... It's like... You think, yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me. Except it's, like, all out, like, it's gotta be 50 dudes and it's gotta be even more chill than that. Absolutely. Well, originally, what I was telling Ross off mic, they started off to keep the sailors on tune so that, like, the rigging and everything was done efficiently and, like... Ah, the rigging. Yeah, the rigging of the ship, you know, to get the sails up and everything like that, get the lines tied off. Starboard! Sure, that means right, but we'll keep rolling. Uh, port left, four letters, told you that one time. You'll never forget it. About face. What? Nothing. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, sea shanties are just, I mean, to Gen Z, they really embrace our thought process of, of reject, or embracing tradition and rejecting modernity, you know what I mean? No, I don't. Okay, well, it, it's all about, you know, coming back to our collective roots, and I, I like to see, you know, so, Our some collective things, roots. Yeah. We don't have collective roots. The though. pirates are our collective roots now, I'm mm, taking them Okay, on. okay. Maybe. I, I mean, see that's this argument, the, we are a pirate podcast. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at what... Our people, I mean, kind of, kind our of people. steal our shit. Your steal people. A bunch of shit. We don't share people. Okay. We don't share people. A sea shanty, chanty, or chanty with no E. Chant? Chanty. Is a type of work song that was once commonly sung to accompany rhythmical labor on board large merchant sailing vessels. The term shanty was most accurately referred to a specific style of work song belonging to this historical repertoire. So, some... <laughs> Dude, at some point, figured out one of these slapped on TikTok. Everybody and their dad has gone to making sea shanty videos. And, and like I said, they go harder than you would expect. Like, you know how when you hear a Lil Jon song? Well, no, that's a bad example. You know how when you hear like a, what did the, what did the kids listen? Lil Uzi Vert song, and it builds up to like the first fucking most hype moment in that song, and you just get ready to do shit? You wouldn't expect like a random pirate sea sailing song to get you to that same place. That's the beauty of the sea shanties, though. And the beauty of them, too, is like if you're a part of the sea shanty singing, 
all you have to do is listen to the first verse and you know the whole song. It's just repeated over and over and, and you, over again. You just got to find your tone. Exactly. So you add a your little key. bit. You add a little bit to the harmonization of the group right there. You get the energy going together. Do you remember that video that went viral in the mid two thousands? That was all the guys singing ha- the Halo theme song in the bathroom, like the no. high school bathroom. No. You never seen that one? I'm sure a lot of people no. that listen to the pod have seen that one. There's a video that went really viral of a bunch of high schoolers singing the Halo theme song in a bathroom. Why are all these kids singing in bathrooms? You just it's the best me a place video to sing. These kids singing in ba- That's oh, where the you acoustics. have the best acoustics. It's the yeah. acoustics. That's Duh. what it is. Question obviously, answered. if you're gonna be a singer in high school, you obviously go to the bathroom to sing. Come on, everybody knows that. You obviously didn't sing enough in high school. So but zero now in high school. Zero I just love zero. the thought that you could be wafting yourself by a nice high school bathroom first thing in the morning between first and second period and wafting you hear the yourself beautiful by. sounds I'm gonna call it of a every sea single, shanty. Uh, every single wrong word you use today, I'm, I'm taking you down. Um, wafting could be used as a term for moving, kind wafting of. Wafting is when you waft something Yeah, but you can face. like waft slowly through a hallway, kind of. Like, it it you makes absolutely sense. Everybody cannot. knows. You, you definitely absolutely can. cannot. Definitely can. You can walk slowly. Uh, no, you're not wrong. You can pass for... or cause to pass. Uh, nope, you're wrong. Never what? Mind. You're wrong. Sorry. It Continue. can be used as... Continue, you're wrong. I'm still gonna use it. You mean go in... I just love this. the thought of hearing a sea shanty coming loudly and abrasively out of the bathroom. That just gives me so much energy. That gives me joy. Yeah, it gives me joy too. Thinking about going... Thinking about knowing <laughs> like that... Like a there's... teacher walking yeah. the hallways of a, of a high school, and you know, she's out looking for like kids trying to smoke heaters in the toilets or cigarettes or whatever, and then she like, she hears this... One this day the weatherman comes. the bathroom comes. and she says, I have to peek, I have to peek, I have to see what's happening in here. I've got to stop these kids from doing the bad things. They're going to kill them. And then she opens the door and it's like 26 dudes packed into a three stall bathroom <laughs> singing a pirate song. And that's where we're at in the United States as a result of uh, all the, ma- it's really just the whole world. We're all so bored and losing our minds to the extent that we are singing ancient pirate hymns. In large groups, in an effort to raise general morale. That's where we're at. Yeah. Anyway, very random stuff, but we have a great show planned today with uh, one California man's traumatizing story of a move to Texas, mm-hmm. wild news regarding commercials and the big game, as the NFL forces everyone to call it, the most dominant memes in history, and of course our Monday mental health message, so stick around. RBP 368 is brought to you by Felix Gray. There are a lot of blue light glasses on the market. To lump all of them together, though, would be like lumping Honda Civics in with Teslas together as cars. That's that's just not the move. Screens produce most blue light at a certain point in the spectrum, and most clear blue light glasses filter 2-3% to of that blue light from screens. Felix Gray, though, filters 15 times more. They've got high-quality frames. Uh, durable, super lightweight. They can be adjusted to fit any face type. Felix Gray glasses filter 15 times more blue light from screens than other clear blue light glasses. I've got the Faraday frames. I've got the Nash frames. They're both beautiful. All of the Felix Gray products I have tried have been phenomenal. The original optical lenses relieve most eye strain symptoms from daily screen time. Look, we're all stuck staring at screens freaking eight hours a day. For Coles and I, it's like 10 hours a day. We definitely experience the symptoms of eye strain by the end of the day, and my blind ass has worn contacts since I was 12 years old, thereabouts. So glasses, contacts, my eyes being worn out, allergies in Austin, Felix Grays are a lifesaver. Again, look at the Nash and the Faraday frames. Check out their more advanced sleep glasses that relieve serious daily eye strain and were specifically designed for late night screen time to improve sleep. They've got highly curated, timeless styles made from Italian acetate for stylish, durable, lightweight, super comfortable glasses. The industry-leading blue light lenses come standard at $95, or you can add your prescription at checkout starting at $145. Join the quarter of a million people that report noticeable relief from screen time with their glasses. If you don't love your glasses in the first 30 days, their in-house customer care team will take care of exchanges and returns. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash RBP to shop better blue light glasses at their best price ever. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash RBP. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. Felixgrayglasses.com slash RBP. Time for some announcements and shouts. Some birthdays. Happy 24th birthday to Allison. Patrick asked me for a birthday shout out for you, and I just found the reminder I sent myself, and it may have been a long time ago, so I hope your birthday is soon, or just happened. Similarly, happy birthday to Eva May, two years in a row with birthday shouts on the show. That is not an easy thing to accomplish. If you want to watch episodes of our show, you can do so on YouTube, youtube.com slash Media, where we end up putting every Monday and Wednesday episode for you to watch in full video, beautiful video, phenomenal video. I, I believe it's 8K. Probably. If I'm not mistaken, 8K. Maybe I didn't know more. 8K was a thing until recently, but it's 8K uh, is what I'm going to say. So 
youtube.com slash Bolin Media. If you would like an ad-free episode of this show every Friday, we do our Monday and Wednesday show publicly on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube. But on Fridays, ad-free, one place you can get them exclusively on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Ross Bolin Podcast, ad-free episodes every Friday. Get in there, support the show, get more RBP in exchange. Now it's time for our first segment. He moved his family from California to Texas. Awful move, that's where you're starting. An article went viral last week, all right? End of last week from this gentleman, I'll call him, a Californian who moved, like so many Californians have, to Texas. Mm. Now, if you live in Texas, particularly Austin, Texas, you're very aware of the fact that many, 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 many people move here on a weekly, daily, monthly basis uh, from California. California um, ha- is very expensive, Chris, turns it out. As I've heard. It's very, very expensive to live in most of the places in California. Taxes are very high. There are a lot of different um, contributing factors, but as a result, there is almost this mass exodus from California to Texas. Um, it's a we've damn seen liberals, ain't it? Yeah, it's goddamn liberals all. And it, we've seen Elon Musk. We've seen Joe Rogan. We've seen celebrities uh, start to trickle in. More and more celebrities. The richest man on earth, uh, Elon Musk. It's just it's gotten really, really out of control. So the whole time I've lived here, I've been here a decade now, a full decade, as of. January 2nd of this year. And the whole time I've been here, Austin, Texas residents have complained about the massive outpouring or inpouring of Californians. Mm-hmm. Okay. You and told really, me. Really at, just outsiders in general. At one point, it was like 100 Californians a day. Californians yeah, it was, a, a it was day, some right? crazy yeah. amount. Like 150 people were moving to Austin from California a day. I think we're, we're back to climbing toward that number again if we haven't reached it already. So this article, it's a big deal, all right? There's this real sensitivity around, like, because, look, this is a problem. This is how things work, right? There's all these people who have lived here for generations, and they're getting pushed out by very wealthy California people. They can't afford their property taxes. All the property value across the city is skyrocketing to absolutely ridiculous levels. Like, I told you all, one of my neighbor's houses went on sale. What he was able to sell his little 1,000-square-foot house for would make you puke in your own pants unless you're from California and you would go, holy shit, that sounds great, yeah. and then immediately move your ass down here. Well, that's the thing, man. You go and look at, like, L.A. or uh, Sacramento or S- San Diego, San Francisco. You look at the little two-bed, three-bath houses, man. They're, like, $1.7, $2 million, like, just for property. It's insane. Yeah, and depending on which area you're talking about, there's obviously a massive fluctuation in how extreme that is, San of Francisco course. compared to Sacramento, etc. But generally... In Texas, um, and especially in Austin, our almost entire housing market is now determined by Californians incoming. So this article went viral from, by a man named Brett Alder. Alder. It's actually not an article per se. It was published on Quora, which is like the thing Ashton Kutcher invested in 20 years ago where you, you type in a question like, why yeah. won't my PlayStation 5's light turn green? And then like people can answer it for you or whatever, or you can make a statement or... Whatever. I don't, I don't really know what Quora is, frankly. I just get emails from them like once every two weeks. But What I've the never... fuck is that about? I'm getting you emails get them from too? them constantly now. I have no idea where they started coming from. Somebody never, signed us up for Quora. Never have used Quora in my life. So this is on Quora, and I'm just going to start to read it for you, okay? Because it's it's just, there's no real other way to explain it. <laughs> Brett Alder, um, again, he's, he's writing an article about moving from California to Texas, and the column title is, I moved my family from California to Austin, Texas, and regretted it. Is Brett sad? Here are 10 key points every person should consider before relocating. Oh, Brett sad. Usually these are columns written driving more people here. Yeah. So this is the first time everybody in Austin was like, well, this is nice. And then we read it, and everybody in Austin was like, fuck Brett Alder. <laughs> so I'm going to read it for you now. A lot of people, including myself, moved from California to Austin because of the hype and the perception that California and Austin are reasonably comparable in lifestyle. We found that to be far from the case. Oh, God. Here's what we learned. Or, 10 reasons why Austin is not the, quote, California of Texas. But first, what does Austin have in common with California? Austin, like California, is not affordable. The thing that California and Austin definitely have in common is that they're both very expensive. Austin is not cheap. Let the words sink in. Austin is not cheap. It's actually quite expensive. Expensive. We moved from San Diego in 2015 owning a 2,000-square-foot house on a one-third acre, looking for a boost in lifestyle. All right, I'm going to stop there for a second. You were living in San Diego, Brett, on a 2,000-square-foot piece of... Pro- oh, I'm sorry, 2,000-square-foot house on a one-third of an acre in San Diego, immediately letting me know 
that I don't give a fuck about your problems. Yeah. You have enough money to where nothing you say, not a single, you could be like, I have brain cancer. And I'd be like, damn, Brett, big bummer. I don't give a fuck, Brett. Nobody gives a fuck about you if you have a 2,000 square foot house in San Diego on a third of an acre and you're bitching about moving because you were looking for a boost in lifestyle. The rest, people got real problems, Brett. Real problems. All right, I'm going to continue. If you're looking for great schools, the southwest and northwest sectors of Austin are the main options. The only caveat is that northwest Austin, Travis County, it's the whole city, you dipshit, is some of the most expensive real estate in Texas. Okay, so we bought a 4,000 square foot house in Bee Cave. Holy shit! Okay, okay, stop. There we Pause. go. <laughs> Pause. 4,000 square feet. Large house. That is a house. Yes. In Bee Cave. Yes. So let, hey. that is one of the more affluent and and nice neighborhoods in Central Austin. Also, double the size of the house that they moved from in California. Just let's go ahead and just point that out real quick. And in one of the nicest neighborhoods in the city. Yes. And it like says, this isn't like a burb, like just to clarify, this is not like a suburb of Austin. This is like a like a very nice suburb that was built inside of the city. So it's immediately like significantly more expensive. Not than a if you suburb, went, like, but it is a suburb. It's a suburb like neighborhood, but it, you get what I'm saying. Like it's not like out in the burbs. I don't, but I also don't know. I'm trying to explain. I don't know how listeners. normal cities work because I'm from Houston. Yeah. So like, like I wouldn't consider I this a like a suburb. Like B Caves is still like in the city. Like it's like ten minutes from downtown. Depending on where you are, it's it's as central as you're gonna get yeah, in yeah. terms of neighbor. It's like neighborhoods, neighborhoods in that feel like neighborhoods yes. in central Austin, yes. which is a very large city. It's that's as what I'm trying to. So, four thousand square foot house in Bee Cave, an affluent suburb of Austin with great schools. He puts in quotes. We heard Austin was extremely hot, so we got a place with a pool. When you look at a 3D affordability map, these are the factors we discovered people are not taking into account. Taxes. We all know property taxes are high in, ta- in Texas. They actually weren't that bad for us in range from 2 to 3%, depending on the neighborhood. We bought a home at 2.1%, very low uh, interest rate. I have a 4.75% interest rate right now for the, for the example. F- with the homestead exception, we were paying at 1.79% versus 1.25% in California. Don't buy at 3%. You won't be able to sell your house, and your house won't appreciate. Sir, that is wildly inaccurate. I don't even know what he's talking about here. It's I'm like pretty, he was like, I'm going to start this out by throwing some numbers that might confuse some folks into thinking, like, bro, it just sounds like you fucked up, Brett. Somewhere along the way, you fucked up. Because if you are bitching about these minute percentages in, in interest that you're paying on your mortgage for your home, it's like, what do we... Bro, you bought a 4,000 square foot house. The fuck are you talking... Get a smaller house then, Brett. Power. Energy is extremely expensive. You want a big house, and they're so cheap, but then it costs a fortune to heat and cool. Again, they're not cheap. And and yes, you buy a 4,000-square-foot house it's gonna in a be... fucking city yeah. that is in the middle of Texas yeah. where we experience heat. And it was like the hottest summer, like one of the hottest summers in a long time this summer. Every summer is the hottest summer That's in a long time. Global fucking warming, Brett. Where the fuck have you been, Brett? Pay attention, you stupid bastard. I'm imagining, too, he's thinking that like his $2,000 heating and uh, cooling bill is going to be the ex- or 2000 square foot heating and cooling bill is going to be the exact same as like heating and cooling a house that's literally double the size. And he's like extremely confused. Oh, just you heating, wait. His heating and air went up. We were paying $400 per month during the summer and winter, and we were uncomfortable. Our thermostat was set to 79 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and 65 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. To be comfortable would have cost us $700 to $1,000 per month. Okay, you get a bought better... a 4,000 square foot house, Brett. What is wrong with you? Insulate your house better also. Like, there's no reason that you should ever have to keep your house at 78 okay. degrees in the summertime if, you have, if, like, if you're living in bee caves. Get a better insulated house, bro. Brett then went on to bitch about the water and how expensive the water is. Uh... It says services. We thought living in Texas stuff would be cheap, but with so many people moving to Austin, the service industry is is in red hot demand. Expensive pool maintenance, expensive landscaping services, expensive home repairs, expensive dining and movies. You live in bee caves, bro. Travel for reasons described below. Most anyone who can leave uh, Austin for a month or two during the summer to escape the heat does. That's expensive since to get anywhere interesting involves flying and hotel stays. Budget another several thousand dollars per year. Oh my God, Brett, you were the worst. Weather. Uh, I hate finally, this guy. key point: lifestyle. He says, although we doubled the size of our house and kitchen and yard, 
in parentheses, and kitchen, and yard. Brett's almost just humble bragging his way through this entire thing. We felt more cramped and cooped up in Austin than San Diego or San Jose due to the bad weather and lack of public spaces. A 2,000 square foot house with a yard in Austin is cheap compared to the same house in San Diego, but offers nowhere close to the same lifestyle because your yard in San Diego is living space, and in Austin, it's not. So, I just want to clarify, Brett bought a house with a shit backyard, and he's upset. Okay, what the fuck? First of all, Austin... That's, again, wildly inaccurate. Yeah, as somebody that just moved to Austin this summer, Austin has more open spaces than, like, any other city I've ever been to in my entire life. Now, it's one of the most open and natural cities I've ever lived in. The Dixie Chicks song, Wide Open Spaces, was actually written about Austin. Now, here's the beauty of this column. We have not even gotten to his list, his top ten list. We have I, not I even approached already. it. We just now could and will, I guess... I'll oh, just Brett give you the, gi- the look. You get the gist of it, right? If you yeah. read this entire thing, it's just Brett nonstop complaining. It's just Brett like a pussy made a boy. bad decision. Number one, and he hates life. No, for he it. did. I don't even know. He made. It sounds like Brett made many, many, many bad decisions over the course of the first thirty-five years of his life. Number one, the weather. I'm not gonna read this. I don't look. If you can't research the weather of the city you're moving to beforehand, if that's your number one complaint after the fact, yeah, uh, Brett. He's comparing the weather in Austin to San Jose and San Diego on the coast of California. Like, he's completely, completely insane. Number two, no public land. What? Zilker is, like, the biggest park I've ever seen in my life. Soaring Sierra Nevadas, sandy beaches, public space canyons, and even trails along creeks are standard fare in the West. Not to mention Yosemite. Not so in Texas. Barton Springs, Lady Bird Lake, Zilker Park. Uh, fucking, uh, what's the overlook? Uh, Mount oh, Bunnell. Here you go, here you go. One Lake example. Austin. We drove 90 minutes to visit Enchanted Rock, a granite rock outcropping that would largely go unnoticed on the West Coast. We visited on a Saturday and met a three-mile-long line of cars waiting to get in. Running out of gas, we grabbed lunch early at a nearby town and tried again later. No dice, the parking lot was full and closed. What did you do, Brett? Did you go on, like, Enchanted Rock Day or something? Because I went this past summer and none of that happened. None of it. None of it, except that it was incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. He went on like the Fourth of July, and he was was, like expecting it to be like nobody is out there or something like that. He said holiday weekend. This is a place I went as a child, Christopher. Yeah, like to learn about my state and enjoy the outdoors. Sure. He said, "Now we've now christened the site Disenchanted Rock. Three hours of driving and no hiking." Got him, Brett. you, You and your family should be flung into the abyss of space. Number three, nowhere to go. Brett, it's a it's an international pandemic, Brett. If you, it, he said, it, if you live in Austin, things don't change much in a huge seven-hour drive radius. Again, it's Texas. It's a state. And you could have researched this ahead of time. That's so not. That's still not true. Like that's still just seven false. hours. Seven hours, dude. I can be in like the desert mountains of Texas in seven hours. We live in the green hilly country. I can pick a direction, and in seven hours, I can find you pretty much any climate. In I could be in a different. Country in seven hours, Brett. Easy. Mexico is right there, Brett. You dumb bastard. Four. Dishonesty. Now this is where things take a very strange turn. If they, if you weren't already there, I'm just gonna read you the opening graph of the dishonesty section because I don't is know it how to graph. Exp- Paragraph. Oh, okay. Think okay. about integrity. Much? I didn't. I've worked with hundreds of companies and thousands of people in California. Sure, there are bad apples, but by and large, integrity is a default way to treat people here. It's not even something we talk about. Not so in Austin. First, it was the people we bought the home from. They lied about the cause of a leak, failed to disclose well water quality issues that made us sick, lied about how much stuff cost to repair, etc., but it didn't stop there. We hired a guy with a five-star rating on Yelp to pull up a flooded carpet who completely and very obviously busted our closet doors while removing them and never said a word about the damage, or whose carpet cleaner made a foot-long burn mark upstairs and left without a word, or the mover, also five stars on Yelp, we hired who offered to help sell our leather sectional and $600 ping pong table and split the proceeds with us. We never heard back from him. We're not holding our breath. Brett, it sounds like your dumb ass got robbed. And they knew that you were idiot Californians moving to Austin. They took full advantage of it. Everyone, Brett, everyone hates you, dude. This is what's happening. Let me explain something to you. You're terrible, and everything about you is not a quality that people look for in other humans. Yeah. So they have decided to turn their back on you and your shit family with your fucking pool and your 4,000-square-foot house and your fucking sectional you're trying to get. A $600 ping-pong table, son? What the fuck? 
This is what happened, bro. They moved here, right? They start talking to these lo local Austinites that are helping them out, and they start just immediately talking shit about Austin 24-7, every bad thing that they've experienced from the second they got here, and every single one of them is just like, what the fuck, dude? Like, okay, then I'm just gonna, like, fuck you. Look, generally, Texans are thought of as very nice people. Yes, I've had um, it. Let me just say. It's like an international uh, reputation at this point. It's not like some shit like, I'm not gonna sit here and try to convince you. I could give a fuck what you think, frankly. But I've never heard somebody complain about the attitude and personalities of people in Texas compared to California, the weirdest, most disconnected, and fucked up state in the history of states in any country. If you put out good vibes, the people of Austin give you good vibes back. Suck I've, our dicks. Like, yeah. Number five is literally Yelp, which is a website on the internet and not Everywhere! At all, it's not an Austin thing. Yes, there is good food in Austin, but you can't trust <sighs> Yelp to find it because it doesn't work in Austin. Look- I don't know if y'all in California are, like, able to trust your Yelp reviews or something. In a, here's, here's a general rule of thumb about the internet. <clears throat> it's like I say about Schlitterbahn. <laughs> the more humans, the more of a general population of humans you're dealing with, the more unattractive and unintelligent that population becomes, generally. The internet is made up of all of the humans, so it's the most disgusting and unintelligent place in the world. I don't trust fucking 20 of you. I don't give a shit what 7,000 people have to say about my local southern Indian food restaurant that got 4.5 stars and then it was one of the worst experiences of Brett's life. I don't trust Yelp because I'm not a moron. And also, let's be honest here, the people that are writing reviews for Yelp are most of the time like... Trash humans. Yeah, they're or like, you know, mostly. they're older... They're like, like Brett. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're people they're the, like Brett. They're the people like Brett. If you want to find good food in Austin, I'll tell you what to do. You get in your car, you drive around, you wait until you find a place that looks like the kind of food that you want for that day, and if it looks like a hole-in-the-wall spot that you've never seen before or never been to a place like it, I guarantee you the food's going to be excellent, and that shit is not going to be on Yelp. I Brent just, just ask, needs to get just, out of his house. I just, like, ask people, I'm like, what's the best restaurants? And, and then, then they'll like, name them, and yeah. I'm like, dope, and I go try those, and then generally they're... Correct. I have like, no joke yet to have bad food in Austin. I've had food that like I haven't enjoyed just because my personal taste preferences, but I have no joke have yet to have bad food. The, uh, the look, food in Austin is incredible. I can assure you it exists, but as a dude who came from Houston, which is, you know, widely regarded as one of the best food cities in the country, sure. we do fat people like nowhere else. Kay. Or actually, that's not true. We've gotten a little skinnier, but... Um, Austin food is not bad. It is not bad. It's a no. very good selection. It's not crazy. It's not like, you know, it's not like one of the best food cities in the country or anything crazy. But, like, th this dude complaining about not being able to find food and not being able to use Yelp, uh, he's unbelievable. And also, Number six is literally rudeness, Chris. Like, that's just not true. Like, Most Austinites true. are rude, he says. That's just not true. They're probably rude to you because you're walking around in, like, a three-piece suit driving a fucking, like, Mercedes AMG. We met some amazing people in Austin, like my work colleagues in church congregation, and even bumped into Matthew McConaughey at our kids' flag football game. There are some very wonderful, friendly people, but we also met more than our fair share of the others. Hey, Brett, that's just humanity again. Um, you're, you're complaining about the other humans, which exist in every city. Like... Exhibit A was the dad, also at a kid's flag football game, wearing the Don't Move to Austin t-shirt, a play on Don't Mess with Texas. Let me get this straight. I uprooted my family, moved across four states, and that's the welcome I get. And the worst part of it all is that it's Holy. not even funny. There's a bumper sticker in the West. Montana sucks. Tell your friends. Same message, but with some humor. Yeah, we've got that, bro. Like, what? the joke's for us. Um, Brett, the joke's not for you. You suck. Brett's like, I moved to this new city, bro, and, like, nobody came and was like, dude... I'm so stoked you're here, dude. Like, Brett, thank fucking God you moved to Texas. Hey, everybody. Brett! Let's, let's get to the airport. It's fucking Brett! Brett's plane is landing. We've oh got to give him a grand welcome. Make sure we suck every one of his toes as he's getting off the fucking PJ that he's going to fly down from California to get into his 4,000 square foot house with his pool. Brett, beat your own ass, Also, dude. was Brett saying that Montana sucks is funny? Does he Is he saying that there's humor to that bumper sticker? Because that also sucks, Look, Brett. He, he loves the joke, Montana sucks. Tell your friends exclamation point, but he hates the joke. Don't move don't to Austin. Don't move to Austin, which to me is funnier than the other one, but whatever. Then, and Montana doesn't suck. Montana's dope. Number seven, well, that's the, the joke is that Montana people sell the shirt. 
Oh, yeah. to keep people. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, you okay. get it. Get Number it. seven, a conservative now. dystopia. If you ask people from other parts of Texas, they'll say that Austin is not representative of all of Texas. That is probably true, but here are a number of messed up things about Travis County, Northwest Austin. Now he just has a list, a list of the problems that he has with the the city, and he's counting this as number seven as a conservative dystopia. I, he gets into like natural gas, public schools, water again. He's already done water. Now it's reappearing on number seven. Number eight is monoculture, which I have to Google. I'm just going to read you the beginning. I love getting to know people from other cultures. In California, we've had Vietnamese neighbors, Iranian neighbors, Filipinos, Palestinians. You name it, we love it. In parts of Texas, it's not just a monoculture, but a monoculture that doesn't seem to be aware of its own blandness. Think Bro. about it. Are you ready to have your son judge based on his suitability for a future career in football? Are you ready to network by attending the local high school football game with the guys? Because that's a thing in Texas, and not just that, the lack of openness to diverse ideas leaves you with the feeling that you've traveled 15 years back in time technologically moving there. They voted out Uber and Lyft and think that's not a big deal because, wait for it, they have a ride-sharing Facebook group. Yeah, that should be great for our out-of-town visitors. They also don't have a lot of the options we enjoyed in San Diego, like, quote, game-only soccer leagues, end quote, for friends. Don't know what they're for kids. Don't know what that means. I think it means no practicing, which sounds dumb as shit. The car washes were lame, period. That's just a sentence. You just couldn't trust... Things to be as well thought out and executed as in California way. Can't wait for this dude to get murdered in the street. Number nine, punitive militaristic schools and sports. I'm not reading this. I'm not reading this. Also, I, let me I just say, this. this dude moved to bee caves. He moved to like, and like he moved to a culture bubble like that is intentional it was built that way that's how b caves was built it was like a lot of fucking tech people that move from california that have lots of money live in b caves and Terrytown and like travis county up there if you want diversity don't move to b caves he every yeah, i don't really get this confusion this is like everything that he has said has been brought on by, by himself by him yeah number 10 is cedar allergies if there's one you didn't know okay, uh, well, was that's... not his fault there's a good chance you'll be sick the whole first year in austin being exposed to a new set of pathogens this is very true That's and a true. fair argument, yep. and it's the only point on his entire list that I will allow. But I will say, it's also very telling because we, we're strong. Like, we toughen this shit out, and now we're coming out of it as, like, a better-built immuno people. You know what I mean? Well, we got you, the you, got a, you got a few years ahead of you, but you'll be all right. Okay, but we're on the rise. You know what I mean? We're well, on, I'm, I'm straight, player. Brett, I've been here a decade, dog. Brett's out. Brett, Brett he's just going to be, like, he's not going to be able to hang out around cedar trees for the rest of his life because he's too much of a pussy to live through the year in Austin. Brett's one of the white people yelling, I can't breathe. Number 11, big luxury <laughs> home obsession. He said, I couldn't stop at 10. I'm guessing because of the lack of public land, terrible weather, et cetera, that Austinites get really into their houses. Yeah, that's only here. We're the people who invented being super into which home you live in. Also, the We saw some unbelievably great. ornate homes, castle-esque, and there's pressure to keep your house immaculate. You can buy a home that is really nice by California standards, parentheses, updated kitchen, crown moldings, in parentheses, only to find out that everyone else's house is much nicer than yours, which we didn't care about until we found that no one wanted to buy our less-than-luxurious home. Again, it sounds like you made a poor decision... You bought a shitty house. With a shitty backyard. And now you're trying to sell it at a price that no one wants to pay. I, I Again, moral of the story. Here's his ending. It would take a lot of money to buy a California-like lifestyle in Austin. If you're moving to Austin, make sure it's because of the things that it offers. Quote, uh, parentheses, downtown lifestyle, barbecue, football, live music, nice houses, and professional opportunity. End parentheses. That you won't miss the things you're leaving behind. Good weather, public spaces, etc. It was an expensive. He only mistake, has two things there. But my family and I now see and etc. My family and I now see California in a completely new light. We feel very fortunate to be I'll living in the, the Bay Area. Back, bro. You're welcome. And then it says, Brett Alder is a sales executive working in the semiconductor industry based out of San Jose, California. Oh, so he's making like seven hundred thousand a year. Whatever Brett's deal may be. This is one of the more poorly written, pathetic bitch fests I've ever read in my entire life, and I've worked on the internet for a full decade. This man d deserves the entire Billy Madison, I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul monologue. Um, so I feel like I'm, I need to read it for him. What's his last name? Alder? Yeah. Mr. Alder, what you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent column were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. 
everyone listening to this podcast is now dumber for having heard it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Next segment. Big brands are sitting out the Super Bowl. I, I had no clue on this. I had absolute. I had honestly. I hadn't really put a whole lot of thought into the Super Bowl. Me neither. You and I watched uh, Brady beat Rodgers a little bit yesterday. Uh, what? Who's that? Who? Mahomes, uh, it, beat Mahomes Allen. Brady Super Bowl matchup. Very exciting stuff, right? Little I'm sorry. The big, big game. Little goat versus big goat. Yeah, the old, the old savvy greatest of all time veteran against clearly the greatest young quarterback we've seen in a in in a bit in the league right now in the form of Patrick Mahomes. So. This is the big news uh, regarding the big game, otherwise known as the Super Bowl, from the Associated Press. Budweiser joins Coke, Pepsi brands in sitting out the Super Bowl. For the first time since 1983, when Anheuser-Busch used all of its ad time to introduce a beer called Bud Light, the beer giant isn't advertising its iconic Budweiser brand during the Super Bowl. Instead, it's donating the money it would have spent on the ad to coronavirus vaccination awareness efforts. Anheuser-Busch still has four minutes of advertising during the game for its other brands, including Bud Light, Bud Light Seltzer Lemonade, Michelob Ultra, and Michelob Ultra Organic Seltzer, some of its hottest sellers, particularly among young viewers. Yeah, that, but, those golf beers. Yeah, but the decision to not do an athemic, anthemic, anthemic, anthem, anthemic. Yeah. Budweiser ad, which over nearly four decades has made American icons of frogs chirping Budweiser, Guys screaming, what's that? And of course, the Budweiser Clydesdales showcases the caution with which some advertisers are approaching the first COVID era Super Bowl. Quote, we have a pandemic that is casting a pall over just about everything, said agent or Paul Argenti, Dartmouth College professor of corporate communication. Sounds like horseshit. Quote, it's hard to feel the exuberance and excitement people normally would. End quote. Yeah, fucking A, Paul. <laughs> No, fucking A, Paul. No shit, brother. Fucking A it is. The Anheuser-Busch move follows a similar announcement from PepsiCo, which won't be advertising its biggest brand, Pepsi, in order to focus on its sponsorship of the halftime show. <laughs> I was like, what? what is this story here? Is it that the corporate American world is recognizing the pandemic and that they might need to do some shit to try to help out? Is that the, is that the story? It's kind of sad that uh, Budweiser said that their money is going to go to uh, COVID vaccination awareness not like distribution or anything like that, to make like anti-vaxxers not be afraid of the and, vaccine. And what does that mean? Does Anheuser-Busch have to make commercials for us to know about the vaccine? Like, shouldn't the fucking government be on that? <laughs> like, do we need our largest beer company that I'm pretty sure is owned by a Belgish... That's not a word. Belgium wow. family? Belgish? Belgish? What are the Belgium people called? Somebody help me out in chat. Ooh. I just don't understand this entire scenario. How they thought like, all right... Look, guys, it's th here's here, I'll give you an example. Every social media person in the world on 9-11 is like, how can I make a 9-11 post that is both effective <sighs> and doesn't offend anybody? And it's the dumbest idea of all time. Yeah. It's like, if your brand doesn't have anything to do with 9-11, then shut the fuck up and go about your business. Nobody fucking cares. Um, just try not to make any terrorist jokes in your commercials on that day and you'll be straight. You do not need to make a fucking statement every 9-11 if you're, you know, jello. We don't need a jello commercial about the Twin Towers falling. We don't need Anheuser-Busch on the COVID vaccination education front, or at least that's what I thought. Apparently we do. Um, other big brand absences... I mean, I'm sorry, big brand absences are not the only thing that's going to make the Super Bowl look different this year. Only 22,000 people are going to be allowed in. That's a third compared to usual. It's usually like 65,000-ish. Like, obviously, Super Bowl parties, probably not going to be the same type of deal this year, right? But to, to think that the commercial side of things will be different, very strange. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, my God, are there not going to be any great commercials? Get the fuck out of here. Just because Budweiser and Coke and whoever... Um, by the way, again, every single one of these we've mentioned, like Budweiser still advertising its other yeah. products. Yeah. Pepsi still doing the halftime show. Um, just because they're pulling out of different spots doesn't mean people won't pull in to take them, like the new TikTok rival Triller, apparently. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest. I mean, I feel like as we move more and more into the social media age, like these ad companies are going to start to spend less and less on these massive Super Bowl ads that are going to end up just going viral on Twitter anyway. You know what I mean? And that's a big piece of the puzzle now is like, it used to be you were limited to the event. Yeah. So your your ad ran during the Super Bowl. Everybody talked about it the next day. You got, you know, a week of buzz off that ad. You ran it some more after the Super Bowl to keep people talking, and that was kind of it. Yep. Now it's like 
You put it out a week beforehand. Make sure it's online first. Or like a teaser a week beforehand or something like or that. Or some kind of crazy massive build-up marketing mm-hmm. thing, like yep. crazy scheme. Like remember when uh, Planters did the Mr. Peanut dying yes. or whatever? Yes, yeah, yes. all like kinds of shit leading up, for up like to a it. Month. Yeah. yeah, Those are great. Um, and then you'll have all kinds of social media sides to, this, to the whole marketing strategy, yep. like where there's stuff you're seeing on social related to the commercial that's not in the commercial that's like yeah. this whole fucking experience well, around the Super Bowl ads. GoDaddy was kind of the first that I can remember that really started doing it to where they would show like the first half of commercial and right when it started to get kind of like risky. Yeah, Danica a little Patrick bit, would almost unzip her jacket. And then it would be like to watch the rest of the video, go to GoDaddy.com. I, I'm gonna be real with you. I was always very confused. I was like, yo, I know they're trying to get me H, like horny. Yeah. Um, but this isn't it. Like it was just Look, it doesn't take much if it's Danica Patrick, frankly, she's a beautiful woman, uh, to get me to go to a website sure. based on like a potential strip tease scenario. Well, I mean, the obviously. The fact that they yeah. couldn't execute that properly, that I never went to GoDaddy based on, that I was just like, uh, we both know she doesn't take that jacket off. I'm not going to lie. I went once when I was like 13 on my iPod Touch. See, I was a little older, so Definitely. I kind of, I was like, I'm aware of porn. Thank you, GoDaddy. I, I don't like... need this particular commercial <laughs> to get my rocks off. I, I was like fucking heart racing, adrenaline pounding, like, go Dan- Danica Patrick. Daddy dot. And then it was just like fucking a video of her. Just like, it was yeah. nothing. It was absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's it always. nothing, nothing fantastic. It was never yeah, worth it, yes. I guarantee you now, like, if you could pay... Like, if you could pay for a 30-second ad time on the Super Bowl and then get people to go to your socials, that's accomplishing two things at once as an advertiser, and it's saving you money. So right. I think we probably kind of get – we're starting to get towards the end of this massive mil, multi-million now, dollar now, Super Bowl commercial. I'm going to stop like. you there. We're absolutely not. We're absolutely not. You don't think you so? got it? No, but here's why. The eyeballs are there. Sure. And any time the audience is there, the money is there. So sure. it's just going to be – what. The point that you're absolutely correct on is that the new age social media marketing stuff has completely changed the game when it comes to running a Super Bowl ad, and that many, many, many more companies will feel like, yo, I'm not paying that. Or at like, least we'll figure out our own way to spend $6 million start, on a 45-second fucking ad. Yeah, at least certain to kind of weigh the money. Absolutely, absolutely. Definitely more than they would have in the past, especially because there's, like we said, so many more opportunities to get your message out in other ways, pay Facebook. That's really the only other one. And you know, you the, goal, Zuckerberg. the goal at the end of the day is to get the click. So if you can get people to click already just to see the end of the video, step in the right direction. Crazy shit. Uh, Obviously, Super Bowl ads being developed under completely different circumstances compared to any other year that we've experienced, all in pandemic circumstances and conditions, um, without most of them, without any clue how the presidential election would turn out, these commercials had to be developed, which is an interesting angle. And I guarantee you, too, you're going to see a lot of Super Bowl commercials this year that are, like, you know how Super Bowl commercials, like, Pepsi used to always do ones that had, like, a thousand people in them, and it was a bunch of people coming together and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like Kendall Jenner, like, stopping racism. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly that. Solving racism. And uh, I feel like now we're just going to get a lot of, like, you know, two to three people in a in a, in a commercial because of COVID. You couldn't Can't film do. these Can't massive these crazy commercials or anything like that. These grand yeah. schemes or anything. Or maybe we'll just get a lot of animated commercials. It'd be interesting to watch. Budweiser's vice president of marketing, Monica Rustke, said the brand is still calculating how much it will spend on vaccine awareness, but she said it will be a multi-million dollar commitment that includes donating airtime throughout this year for the nonprofit, the Ad Council and COVID Collaborative's COVID-19 Vaccine Education Initiative. Every name I have seen around this, like whether it's Biden's New Deal about COVID or this, COVID Collaborative's COVID-19 Vaccine Education Initiative. Why do people have to make things sound so important and official? Like, nobody knows what that means. Just use regular people words for regular fucking people. Thank you. What would you call it? I don't... know. learn about not COVID Not the COVID plan? Collaborative's COVID-19 Vaccine Education Initiative. How about just COVID-19 Vaccine Education? Bingo. Like, Somebody you could even Ross. throw initiative on the end. Initiative's a good word. I like initiative. All right. Um... Budweiser will still have a marketing presence around the big game. <laughs> avocados from Mexico are oh, completely wow. sitting out, which is big sad for Aww. me because Avocados from Mexico was always my favorite commercial because I always liked the That little, was one of our new ones. The they little, just recently started making waves for yeah, the last the, couple times, The right? little jingle at the end. Avocados from Mexico. Yes, that's good shit. It's a banger. Oh, this is, this is an interesting... Starting Monday, the brand will air an ad that celebrates resilience during the pandemic, including a socially distanced birthday parade and athletes in Black Lives Matter jerseys. Who is this? Budweiser. Okay. Again, Budweiser, the moral compass of America. We need them. Yeah, thank God our corporate overlords are just pointing us in the right direction. I just want to I just want to put this out there. It is completely insane that alcohol companies o- operate the way that they do. Any other drug, any other drug 
nicotine, weed, if any of them were like, okay, let's just pour millions of dollars into shit that is so over the top, obviously, just to make us look good in an effort to cancel out the death, the cancer, the suffering, the tears, the blood, like... Everyone would see straight through this shit. This is, it's so weird to me. It's a, it's like we've just, as a country, as a world, really, we were just like, everything related to alcohol gets a million passes because so many of us need it. But like, what about the fucking rest of us who use other shit? I, it's just a totally different standard that blows my mind. Like, if a fucking, if like, <laughs> I don't even, like, it, it's like if, I don't want to compare it to like Oxycontin because that was such a, brutally fucked up situation but it seriously is like if purdue pharma or whoever whichever one made oxy was like we're gonna make commercials for oxy but like about going to get vaccinated yeah or something I, I, there isn't a comparison because nobody else is allowed to operate like this it's just very strange to me the ad narrated by actress and director rashida jones ends with healthcare workers getting vaccinated and talks about budweiser's donation but budweiser is an it's just an alcohol comp. They make beer. Yeah, but I mean, I guess in my mind, I would rather it be that way to where they're at least doing some form of good than just like laying low and not doing anything and I, just like selling beer. Yeah, I, I just don't, don't, I don't like know. that, that it, it ties in alcohol, drinking beer into this like, hey, it's okay no matter what. Like, you know, here's what I mean. I get that. There's some I get guy sitting saying. on his couch at home who drinks 20 beers a day that sees the Budweiser vaccine commercial and is like that's validating somehow sure so it's just it's just an entirely confusing morally situation i i don't know what to make of it i don't know why we need budweiser to be in charge of our pandemic education i mean like you were saying any type of name attachment i mean that sells more product At the end of the day the goal of capitalism sell the most product i, mean, I know can... but it's like know your lane like stay in your lane but why would you you know if you can attach your name to this like you said if some guy sitting on the couch can see this as a validation and you can sell another bud light because morals that's why in other sports news here's a headline miami heat to deploy covid sniffing dogs in return of fans to arena yeah i saw that i didn't even know covid sniffing dogs was a thing can you sniff covid uh, and can't dogs get COVID? I don't like. Are like, we putting think, these dogs at risk? No, nah, I think that ended up being um like a very small fraction of okay. animals. Like there, were, I remember the stories about yeah, like yeah. a dog has COVID. Now a fucking sheep has COVID. Like <laughs> Paul has COVID. Like we, we, it's just, it's just. I don't even know. The Miami Heat are bringing back some fans with help from some from <laughs> some dogs. This is the Boston Globe. D A D A W. No, I wish. The Heat will use coronavirus-sniffing dogs at American Airlines Arena to screen fans who want to attend their games. They've been working on the plan for months, and the highly trained dogs have been in place for some games this season where the team has allowed a handful of guests, mostly friends and family of players and staff. Starting this week, a limited number of ticket holders will be in the seats as well, provided they get past the dogs first. The first Heat game with ticket holders is set for Thursday against the Los Angeles Clippers this week. That's the most information I could find. So again, it doesn't go into how these dogs are sniffing COVID. That's genuinely the only thing I care about. I don't know. Again, this is like, I don't know. You know when you're in the airport and you see the bomb sniffing dog and you're like, I want to pet it. Yeah. But you can't. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could. It would probably just like bite your hand off. No, nah, the dude holding it will tase the fuck out of you, That's I think. It. Um, you can try. I've actually seen a little kid pet the dog. It depends on which guy you fuck with, sure, I think, because sure, sure. it just depends. The but one time I've ever... This is, like, way worse than that. I'm in a fucking... Going to see a basketball game, they got dogs trying to sniff my what? My my cells? I guess, what, dude. Can, so what, what else can we sniff? What I'm imagining is they're sniffing to see if you, like, are, like, feverish. Like, if you're, like, feverish and sweaty and, like, fucking, like... I don't know. What if I just did a? Pump? I don't know. We got a pump in. This that's is crazy. The only, that's the only thing I had in my mind. Here's what I, I don't mean, know. though. Like, what if we sprinted because we don't want to miss the fucking tip? And then we get, and that's and what they're the sniffing for. And then they door, don't let you in. German Shepherd tackles me and eats my face because I thinks I have COVID. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Because I mean, if you had shot fireworks off near your backpack or something like that, and then you go to the airport, the bomb sniffing dog's gonna think you have a bomb in your backpack. You know how like I don't know if you know this, but like when you drop little kids off at school right now, you know, and they walk up to the front door, and the first thing that happens is like a, a, a teacher puts a thermometer up against their yeah. forehead. Why do we kiss? Some dude can't just build the thing over the door that goes and just like comes down for each person and tucks our head. Well, you know what I'm saying? Why the fuck do we need dogs for this? And if we have dogs that can do this kind of thing, how about this? Like some cancer sniffing dogs. Sure. Yeah. If Let's they can sniff COVID, why can't they sniff everything? Train all the dogs to sniff cancer, 
release them into the wild. We all get early warnings when we get when we get cancer. Which How we, sick would it we be all if we just do. like if there was like a section of society that just like their job was to train dogs to just like walk around all the time, and they would just like return home at night, just either as like as like service dogs, cops, cops. Yeah, they do a great job. This as is cops. how we fix our police force. We yep. replace human beings with, with dogs. canines. Yep, absolutely. Uh, they'll like walk with you across the street. They'll give you a hug. You can pet them if you need. Like they imagine help the how elderly. much better society would be if we just had like really well trained train dog forces in every major city. I would love if we let the dogs run our whole shit. I think they should be in charge uh, of, of everything, including planning Anheuser-Busch commercials commercials for the uh, for the Super Bowl. Com- couldn't agree with you more there, in all honesty. Mm. Uh, I failed to mention a, um, a very important, special athlete that is very near and dear to my heart that has exited the Houston sports franchises over the past two weeks. I've named all the other ones. I've bitched and moaned and cried. George Springer Mm. of the Houston Astros, now with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, One of my all-time favorite baseball players, a Houston great, and a legend that deserves a ton of respect, so I wanted to make sure I threw him a bone today and uh, acknowledged him and everything that he did for the city of Houston. He was phenomenal. Toronto, you're lucky to have George enjoy Canada. Um, One of the greatest I've ever seen hit a baseball, play at all baseball. Love the dude. An inspiration and a a real role model for, uh, for all the Canadian children up there who are switching over from hockey to baseball. As a result of George Springer. RBP 368 is also brought to you by My Bookie. We're talking about sports. If you're betting on sports, you should do it in one place with our sports betting sponsor, My Bookie. It's that time of the year when divisions are decided, champions are crowned, the Super Bowl is incoming, legends are going to be born, the NFL playoffs almost done. You've waited and watched all year long as your team rose to the top or fell to the bottom, but now it's your turn to win big either way. Doesn't matter if your team sucks ass. The Houston Texans are trash. They're absolutely terrible. I still bet on the NFL all season long. You can't wait to bet on the Super Bowl, just like I bet on the uh, conference championships over the weekend. You've heard the name just about everywhere. My bookie, they're the industry's leading online sports book and casino. It's not hard to understand why with thousands of lines to bet on all of your favorite sports, NFL, NBA, college ball. Check, check, check. MMA and soccer. Check, check. Conor McGregor, were you sad about McGregor? Uh, no, I mean, he got the bag. I mean, but in that, like, three losses in a row, he's probably, like, hang up the gloves. At this I point. didn't like watching him walk past the dude and go, you broke my leg, you bastard. Oh, and I heard like, about that, And he's, like, barely too. limping. It's this very awkward, like, I don't know. I just feel like that man has, like, $350 million in yeah. the bank, and he should go, like, take a big chill The somewhere. fact that he was wearing a million-dollar watch two weeks ago tells me that he's probably good. Also, them motherfuckers get those watches for free. Do not get it twisted. Most of them motherfuckers are getting their watches for free. Something important to remember about the also, richest celebrities in the world. Also, conceptually, I just don't understand how something that can fit here can cost one million dollars. Yeah, it just conceptually, I don't understand that. Imagine at if all. you took that swing though. If you were like, hold on, let me finish this read. Yeah, Let's yeah, get yeah. Back go to for that. it. Sorry. Take advantage of my bookie's prop builder and live in-game betting. Uh, every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Their mobile-friendly website is phenomenal. Visit today. Get your deposit matched halfway up to $1,000 when you use the promo code RBP. Stipulations apply. Make your first deposit. Put the code RBP in. You will get a halfway deposit if you, uh, deposit bonus. If you put in $1,000, they'll give you an extra 500 Stipulations apply. The best part is they make it easy and simple with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make uh, sure you get your bets in all day, every day, week, month, and year at mybookie.ag. Look at the graphic. we got a presenting that. sponsor. Look at us. We're making big moves on YouTube. If you're, uh, if you're not watching on YouTube, I feel sorry for you. Bet, win, get paid at mybookie.ag today. Use the code RBP when you sign up, and if it's your first deposit, you'll get that deposit matched halfway up to $1,000. Stipulations apply. <gasps> Next segment. Wait, let's finish what we were talking about. Million Where dollar watches. Million dollar watches. Yeah. What were you saying? Conceptually, just to have $1 million sitting on your wrist, to me... That's just like I get how it okay, happens. Yeah. Like here's, gold, here's what I was diamonds, say. whatever. I get that. But like, are you fuck a million dollars? Imagine the first guy though. Okay, like you know these watch companies yeah. and whatever. Sure. Imagine the first guy who was like, okay, okay, okay. Hear me out. Hear me out. Yep. They were like, we need to make more money. You're like, we could probably make more money. Or hey, these rich people won't stop giving us their money. How yeah. we can we get more of these rich people's money? And the first guy was like, all right, all right, hear me out. Hear me out. I've been working on this one for a while. It's dope. It's pretty see through on the front. You can see the dials and shit. Like. Whitey's going to love this bitch. Let's put a million dollar price tag on it and just see if we can move it. And then the first one they sold, they had to have thrown just the most absurd party. 
laughing their asses off, just pouring champagne on each other and shit. Like, a million dollars? That's the crazy thing, too, is, like, these company... Like, let's take Rolex out of the equation. These smaller companies that are making these uber-luxurious watches that cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, up to a million dollars, whatever, they're usually tiny. <laughs> like, they're, like, owned by, like, you know, a small group, and then, you know, they have 15 watchmakers, and that's it. And, and they spend boutique no, companies and shit. Yeah, yeah. Like this watchmaker spends like you know a year working on this watch, and then they sell it for the more four hundred thousand dollars or something like that. The it's more crazy. rare they are, typically the more expensive they are. But to think, uh, and to your point, something so small and to have so much value, and just to exponentially apply that like out across the board, it, it got me thinking about. I was watching a Cardi B video a few mm -hmm. months, a couple months ago. Sure. Right, it was her Christmas. Her house decorated for Christmas. She had like five Christmas trees in the yeah. living room. Some insane shit. And I'm sure all like diamond covered ornaments. And like I was just like, I don't know, like I don't know where the line is, but at some point, it's like our boy Brett, this this dude Brett Alder bitching yeah. about his insane life. Like you're aware people are dying. Yeah. Every day. And that's right? what, that's, I mean. If you want to have five Christmas trees, bro, like, that's cool. I get it. You earn that right. Every human gets to do their own thing. But, like, maybe don't put it on social media. Yeah. I don't know. Because, well, because I didn't like, have, like, if I didn't have one Christmas tree and you have five Christmas trees, this is where the whole concept of wealth, socialism, disparity, dis yeah. and that whole rich versus poor and, like, the, the, the have nots versus the haves becomes very, very confusing, and it's like, if you can buy if you can a have $1 million watch... And have it, like, a tiny, tiny little piece of jewelry sit on your wrist... Like, if somebody brought you the option and was like, Chris, all right, here are your options. You got you got your watch here on the left. It's a million dollars. It's yep. really dope. Yep. It's an Audemars Piguet. You're gonna love it. That was can, actually a great made-up watch name. You can, it's real. You can oh. see through the front of it. You're gonna love it. It's a million dollars. Or, Chris, or option two over here yeah. is you can feed 50,000 people this month. That's what, that's why the million-dollar watch issue really kind of rubs me the wrong way because a million dollars can do so much. Now, it is all relative. It and is this all is relative. Where, this is where, let me get this thought bubble going a little yeah. bit. This is where it gets really fucking weird, though. Yeah. Because there are a lot of rich people. Yep. It is all relative. You can apply this to me with my shoes. Let's yeah, do that. Let's sure. do that, all right? Why does a person need 40 pairs of shoes at 200 bucks a pop? Sure. They fucking don't. That's my thing, right? Yeah. That's the yeah. way I like to spend my money. Who's to tell rich people that they can't do the same thing with watches if it's about the same relativism when it comes down to price? So it is this crazy ass argument. I agree. It's In like it sense, becomes so but you weird. Can, like it gets to the point to me where like you can no longer use the relative argument. You know what I mean? Cuz like money is money. Like it is relative, but money is money. Like like yes, a million dollars to him might be a $400 pair of shoes to you, but it's still a million dollars. You go like so. That's where and like that's what I'm saying. I would the say line, inherently. I don't know where it is. I would say inherently, like the thought that we've gotten to the point where we can disassociate that type of value because you've reached that level of wealth, inherently is part of the issue. But regardless, I would like to talk about uh, real quick. There's two annotations on that Cora article from Brett that you read earlier Brett. from uh, from public accounts on Cora, and I think they're hilarious. I'm gonna read them real hit quick. Hit me. Hit me. Austin or go home says. Asterisk, asterisk, written by an obnoxious, judgmental, uninformed individual. And Skygazer says, let me get this straight. You would have us pave over more of our natural spaces so that we can accommodate more people like you, and you think those assholes speeding around you on our city roads are from Austin? Oh, the irony. Godspeed, sir, on your move back to California. Yeah, the funny thing is Austin drivers go 15 miles an hour below the speed limit under normal circumstances, and if it rains, their cars all just creep to a stop. So this dude trying to say we're driving around quick is funny. No, no, those are all the Houston people here. Yeah. You, you, you've misjudged the Austin populace. These folks don't drive fast anywhere. You could have a baby being birthed in the back seat, and they're doing 25 and a 30 in front of you because the whole car is high on Indica. And I love how he's talking about, like, the big home obsession, how it's like he's now, he's like, 
well, I mean, everybody else has a big home, so now we've just started comparing ourselves <laughs> to everybody else, and we're just not happy anymore. <laughs> hey, Brett, why didn't you, why why don't don't you, you just move to a life? more affordable neighborhood, make yeah. some fucking reasonable decisions for or yourself? Live, it, everything he said was compared to other people. Like, yeah. just do your own fucking thing, Brett. Live your life, One man. of the most hateable humans to ever take to the internet to try to share an opinion that nobody wanted to hear. No, absolutely not. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right, let's backfired so bad. We got a couple more things to get through today, so we're gonna move uh, relatively quickly let's through these it. final two. First one is this: most dominant memes in history due to inauguration day. The last several days have been inundated by Bernie, Bernie Sanders, the Bernie Sanders legs crossed, arms crossed, mask on, and mittens meme. My dad sent me more of this meme, more variations of the Bernie meme than any meme I've ever received in my entire life. Your mom posted one on Instagram. My family went all out, all in. Like That was like after day three of my yeah. dad sending us like 120 of these. And my mom put one on Instagram. Like, But I'm telling you, it was a weird thing. Like the first day, everybody in the group text is like, Dad, stop. We've, we've seen them. We've all got Twitter and Instagram. There's too many of these Bernie memes. We don't need them anymore. Please stop. But by the next day, my mom's putting one on Instagram because it just something about the Bernie meme. I don't. It was this way for us all to recognize this insane moment in history, right? It's so it was so funny to me too. How like to a bunch of like conservative people, Bernie is like this radical socialist until he's like until he loses the presidential election and is like crossed up with his mittens. And now he's like a cute old man again. It's just hilarious. I mean, it's it just, just like Ben Shapiro remaking the the uh, fucking Bernie meme. Crack like. The irony is so funny there. It's what did he absolutely do? Pow- he just, made it he with just himself? Remi- yeah, he just redid it. He put on mittens and a coat and just remade the Bernie meme. It's actually a genius move by Shapiro. It kind of marketing-wise is a little bit, but Ooh. just I, absolutely hilarious. Just to be clear, hilarious. sucks a giant, giant sweaty dong. I'm just saying, um, the man knows what he's doing. Oh, and he's to smart. to argue otherwise is... And he knows how to sound smart. That's all you really need. Simply incorrect. He's one of those old money over morals guys, though. He doesn't give a fuck. Oh, yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, like you said, I've never... Never seen a meme go this viral. Not ever. like this, man. I've seen no. a lot of memes. Like I've, I keep harping on this, but I've worked on the internet for a decade now. Okay, I've got some internet experience under the belt. I know the space, and I've never been more annoyed by a meme than I was by Bernie. And I thought it was hilarious at first, but dear God, every single human on the internet. Like this was the first thing about memes that struck me the wrong way. Honestly, when they first started to get hot, I was like, hold up. Now anybody can make jokes and be funny. Like. Well, I was supposed to be my thing. I was focused on that, like, as a fucking career, as a job. And it really opened up the space on the internet to where, like, you didn't need to be able to spell or use words anymore to be funny, which before was a requirement for the humans. In all honesty, sometimes misspelling and not knowing how to use words can make you funnier. Yeah, PFT Commenter built an entire career off of uh, the bit that he can't fucking read or spell, Um, but loves sports. It just this. It's a crazy period of time, the meme period of the internet. And I mean, look, we've all seen the most famous ones that have ever existed. Crying Jordan, you know, like, I mean, there. we'll go through a big list of them just, just to recognize the most dominant in history in a second. But the Bernie meme, again, I was in awe of it. No, me too. I mean, it got to the point where people were taking the meme and animating it into animated movies. It's everywhere. To where he was, like, sitting in the animated movie. Like, I saw He's one like from- He's, like, in NWA music videos and shit. Yeah. I saw one from like uh, the Spirited Away screenshot, the the Studio Ghibli movie, where he's like sitting on the train, like fully animated. He's everywhere. Like, They've put him. The? We have put him everywhere in every scenario, and for some reason, it is pretty funny. But like, and now it's kind of charming. Like I'm, it's kind of to the point where like I'm not even tired of it these anymore. Waves, right? Yeah. It's so weird. Like I'll, I'll I'll be like, God damn, that's hilarious. And three days later, I'm like, all right, this is the most annoying shit I've ever seen. Like a week after that, I'm like, I'm back in on Bernie. Yeah. Same thing happened with Crying Jordan. When it went way crazy, I was like, all right, now y'all have ruined it. But then like a month later, I was like, all right, now this is just part of the internet. We all do this all the time now. Yeah. Like memes go through this ebb and flow where it's like. You enter your fir- original stage of stage of virality, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you either die, or it's like it becomes like an elite god tier meme. Yeah, it that's becomes everlasting in the back pocket. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, no, exactly what you mean. Then Do- it, beca- it becomes one of the permanent options yes. for all of us. Yes, like Doge has has entered elite meme ness. Right. Like he Doge, used to Doge. be. Doge. Explain yeah. Doge. So he in twenty. What does Doge look like? Because <laughs> everybody's seen Doge, but people don't know what you're talking yeah. about. This is what's so crazy about the meme thing to me. Yeah. So the meme. So the original meme was based on a 2010 photograph and became popular in late 2013, and it was actually named as Know Your Memes Top Meme of the Year in 2000. 
2013. What, what kind of dog is it's that? It's that meme of the uh, the dog that's the Shibu Inu, like the one that's all kind of yellow and white. Everybody knows and what he's, I'm talking he's about. He's looking. At, he's looking like this. Yeah, like, he's, he's like. Yeah, yeah. We can probably maybe back at it and throw a picture, a graphic up of him or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, he's got like you know. Yeah, but now he's got his own fucking Wikipedia page, bro. He's entered eliteness because he's been recycled into the bonk dog. So everybody's horny face bonk dog. Horny yeah. bonk dog. Yeah. Everybody's face shopping his head onto this little animated dog that has a stick that bonks you if you're horny. This is silly as shit. This one is from 2013, Doge. Um, it consists of a picture of a Shiba Inu dog accompanied by multicolored text in Comic Sans font in the foreground. The text, representing a kind of internal monologue, is deliberately written in a form of broken English. It's based on a 2010 photograph, became popular in late 2013, was named as Know Your Meme's top meme of the year in 2013. A cryptocurrency based on Doge, the Dogecoin, was launched in December 2013, and the Shibu Inu has been featured on Josh Wise's NASCAR car as part of a sponsorship deal. Doge has also been referenced by members of the United States Congress, yep. a safety video for Delta Airlines, uh -huh. a Google Easter egg, and the video for the, wor the song Word Crimes by Weird Al Yankovic. Toward the end of the decade, the meme saw a resurgence in popularity. Several online polls and media outlets recognized Doge as one of the best internet memes of the 2010s. Doge. And it's a but picture it of a normal dog. Sitting there, just like... Just like, what's up, man? I mean, I got a, I got 100 pictures of my and Bruce in my phone right now that are funnier than that. Not a single one of them would ever achieve this type of meme. It's not a thing you can force. No, nah, you can't force virality with memes. It's just and one of those things. It just happens. It's an internet thing that people who aren't internet people don't really understand. Like, well, why wouldn't you just go do this over and over again? It's like, that's not how it works. You can't, you cannot manufacture that kind of success. It is completely natural, and it's a weird thing. It has to strike some nerve in the human brain or something. And the weirdest ones now, like for Gen Z, the weirdest ones have started taking off again. Like the, uh, have you seen the ones that are like the remakes of the damn shoddy memes? No. There was an original meme, the damn shoddy meme, where it's like a uh, little stick figure guy. I'll show you a picture of it. Shoddy! Uh, not, uh, not shoddy like shotgun. Yeah, like shoddy. Shoddy! So it starts off like this, damn shoddy, you okay? And the original one was the guy getting head, and he's like, damn shoddy. And now it's turned into like a wholesome meme, where it starts out with like this guy with like a, the girl, and he's like, damn shoddy, you okay? And then the next meme is like, let's smoke a blunt and get food. And then it's both of them like in love and happy. Or it's like, let's go out and yeah, go for a walk. You never know with this shit. Yeah, I it's, honestly it's have crazy. no idea. It's I mean, so crazy. Like, you're not supposed to understand. If you're old and you're like, I don't get what a meme is or how they come to be. It's like, you're not supposed to. Like, just, you're cool. It's fine. Just, just appreciate them for what they are. Think of them as art. They come to exist. They're created by an artist and then they become part of our culture and you just have to roll with it. That's it. Is it trash compared to like, you know, real art, like a painting, a watercolor? Yeah. But this is where we're at and it's all we've got left. So just get out there and fucking enjoy crying Jordan, grumpy cat, roll safe, it's a trap. Oh my God. The phase one, phase two, profit, squinting fry, shut up and take my money, sad Keanu, Kermit. Success kid, you know success kid? He's a little kid going like this. Yeah. Like, yes, that kid. Love that kid. Condescending, sarcastic Willy Wonka was up there. That was one one of the OGs that like I was knee deep into my internet career at that point, bro. Like writing blogs well, every day. And I was like, if I have to see Willy fucking Wonka one more time. I'm out. You came across, well, when you started on the internet, you came up, you were there with like the rise of the very first memes. No, that I, was, were like, I was pre meme. And because I remember when they started to hit and it changed everything. So, do you remember iFunny? Yes. So, iFunny was an app that was like one of the original perpetrators that yes. got like meme culture massive. And those memes were not nearly on the level of comedy and originality that these are. They were so basic and so like bad luck, Brian. Um, yeah, but that, like was success OG, kid. That, but that was, was like the OG. That was the foundation what, for what yes, we're looking at dude. now. And, or like, um, what was the one? Bad the dude, guy from the Lord of the Rings. Brian, bro, that was a that was again. That what was, was the one, one of the ones that was like it massive everywhere? Took over my life for days. Do you remember uh, what was the guy from um, the Lord of the Rings that he's like twirling his mustache and he's like, uh, "What if I, what if I told you?" That's what it is. What if I told you? Look up. What if I told you? Me, you'll recognize it immediately. That one was fucking. Everywhere back in the day, Not Lord of the Rings, bro. Oh, what's it from? <laughs> it's Morpheus from the Matrix. No, what? Yeah. Oh wait, you're no, my bad. Okay, there's uh, what if I told you exists in multiple forms? Oh, okay, okay. okay, okay. I, I now see the form you see you're the one talking from Lord about. of the Rings. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, I was no, like, I definitely dog, saw nobody it. Nobody in... in Lord of the Rings had sunglasses on, and there were zero <laughs> black guys. Like, 
<laughs> Morpheus was not there, but you're absolutely right. It's the it's the King Theoden standing with his like two sons behind him or whatever, and it says, What if I told you and Blank. then you are about to read the story of a huge LOTR fan. Whatever the fuck, the second half can and be. And they anything. were like really like kind of lame at first looking back on it, but like that was the original. Close, and close. I funny one does not simply one that, does not that simply. one. That's what it was. was that's what I was talking biggest, about. That's Game of Thrones. Okay, okay. Um Ned Stark's one does not simply Oh wait, no, that is Lord of the Rings. He just also plays Ned Stark. One yes. does not simply walk into Mordor is yes. the line from Lord of the Rings. That's exactly what it was. Now we're on the okay, same page. Okay, now we're on the same page. Now we're on the same but, page. But like those types of memes were the OGs like back in the day. And they were every like there were like five. And at that, that point were there everywhere. were only a few options. Yeah. Only a few options. It was uh different times. To be certain. Absolutely. And now like meme culture is to the point now where like if you don't keep it up with it. It runs the internet. You don't really get it. But if you stay locked into it, you can that's the that's the beauty of memes, man. You can create one image, as stupid as it sounds, that can genuinely per like give so much information and depth to it that if you understand the subculture behind it, you're like Oh my god, that's genius. You it's, know what I mean? It's yeah. so weird. But Nothing seeing, else exists like that. Seeing the ways this has transformed social media to the in, in the next level of that is like TikTok. Yeah. I can create a sound that can become a meme. Yes. Because then that sound is used in hundreds and thousands of videos by other people who find that sound to be funny and the entertaining. The Buss It song. You know the Buss It yeah, challenge that people kind can do? Of a yeah. weird, like, it's now a meme. It's like a collective that we're all a part of yeah. and we're all allowed to grab and use from each other's jokes and drawings. Yeah. And it's just, it's very, very, very strange. It's this whole thing that never, ever, ever existed before and it's this... It's definitely not going anywhere. Yeah, certainly not. I mean, um, now I, I saw a couple weeks ago, I kept getting ads on my feed from Bud Light and Bud Light Seltzer that want, like, meme makers. Like, oh, they're bro. looking for meme makers. Look, specifically meme makers. We, That's it. We're coming full circle here because this is... The conversation was brought about by Bernie Sanders going stupid viral. Yeah. Perhaps the most viral I've ever seen. We also just watched company... I, I mean, by companies, I mean uh, the Republican and Democratic parties spend millions and millions and millions and millions and billions and billions of dollars paying, like... Fucking the fat Jewish and fuck Jerry to produce memes that would drive votes. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at you. You finished uh, the most recent season of The Boys, right? Yes. Yeah. It's like, uh, what's the girl's name? And in, in the Storm not Star Front. Stormfront, right? The yeah. Nazi. Stormfront. Yeah. The Nazi. Stormfront. Yeah. She literally talks about like very based in there. She talks about using memes to win the war, basically. Like that's no case, joke. In her case, the war against non Aryan whites. Okay. Yes, but like the the point definitely remains. Like, Absolutely, I, I've talked to Ross about this. Donald Trump used memes to get elected in 2016. Like those oh, easily, those Obama in, did it before him. Yeah, those impactful short messages, pictures, easily shareable things that get you a retweet and things that get people talking about. Is thanks you. a lot, Obama, a meme. Yeah, am absolutely. I am, am I a meme? That was like one of the original. Remember the the animated face of Obama where he was like. Do you that know anybody like that, says, memes. that says mem? Huh? Do you know anyone who says mem? No, but you that know there used are to people a, out there. Oh, that used to be a highly debated topic. What about how do you pronounce the word GIF? I pronounce it GIF. Thank you, Chris. I'm pretty sure it is GIF. All of our employees here at Bowling Media say GIF. You bunch of jiffers. Fucking Jiffer weirdos. is a boomer term. One of my favorite recent memes wise, and this is a video. Yeah. That could also be a photo. That they could take several forms, these memes. Sure. I don't know what you call the African funeral casket guys. Yeah, the dancing, dancing their the dancing boy guys. down to the funeral thing. I feel like that really went like hand in hand with that. That'll be the meme that I remember the Trump presidency for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because like that shit, it just hit perfectly for everything we had going on last year. Everybody was dying, right? Yep. Everybody was, was still trying to dance. We all wanted to die. If you yeah. weren't dead, you wanted to die. Yeah. And and then that meme was it. Now you just got death and dancing all in the same thing. It's just like dancing our way down to the fucking, you know, six feet under. One of my favorites that uh, is also in video form is the one of the the guy that's holding the cup and he's wearing like a vest and he like looks at the camera and he's like and then he walks oh, away. Yeah. You know what I'm oh, talking yeah. about? With and a big group of people behind with him. A big group of, that's one of the all time one of my all time favorites. He's like, Oh sh I'm out of here. <laughs> I also love the dude um absolutely losing his mind. As if somebody just got fried harder than anybody's ever gotten fried in yeah. his life. And it's like a squad of like nine dudes. All He's just fucking runs off. God, memes are the best. Memes. Welcome to the edge edge of memes. 
Welcome to our edge lord content out here, where we just go through all of the memes. The future, we're so meme. the future, is now. RBP three sixty eight is also brought to you by Black Buffalo. If you are over twenty one years old and you dip tobacco pouches or long cut, listen up. I left tobacco behind in twenty twenty. Several months in now. After so many quitting days, I finally found products that work for me, Black Buffalo being one of them. They have everything you love about dipping at Black Buffalo, including pharmaceutical-grade nicotine, just without the actual tobacco leaf or stem. It's dip literally made from edible green leaves and a simple list of ingredients with the same taste and texture as traditional tobacco products. There is no compromise on the experience. You can keep your routine, but clean it up with Black Buffalo, baby. I dipped for 16 freaking years before I found Black Buffalo and the alternatives that work for me, and I can't tell you how good it feels to be free of tobacco. My mouth feels infinitely better. I feel less like my life is under the control of big tobacco, and literally everything has improved. This was like the last big bad for me to kick tobacco products and with the help of black buffalo i have and you can too no more tobacco in 2021 let's fucking go black buffalo sells exclusively on their website you go to blackbuffalo.com. it's available in both long cut and pouches highly recommend the pouches they're phenomenal you just use the promo code rbp when you check out at blackbuffalo.com for 25 percent off your first order at b-l-a-c-k-b-u-f-f-a-l-o blackbuffalo.com promo code rbp for 25 percent off your first order warning this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Next segment. Monday mental health message. Every Monday, Coles and I like to focus on uh, a, a message, an anecdote, a story, some type of theme related to mental health, as is uh, tradition, is one of the things we focus on in this show. One of the things that occurred to me over this past week, um, had a lot going on in my personal life, I'll just leave it at that for the moment, was that sometimes... You have to ask for help. You have to ask for what, what you need. It's not even help. I don't even mean in the sense that you're struggling necessarily. But you have to ask for what you need from those around you. And here's what I mean. Family, friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, um, sisters, brothers, the people closest to you in your life are often the people most capable of helping you, obviously, right? Your best yeah. friends, your closest people. Too often, in my case, like I feel shame or guilt or some, some sense of, like, self, something about the way I feel that relegates me to keeping my mouth shut instead of just telling somebody who loves me, someone who already wants to help me, uh, who wants to care for me and help me get through each day, what I need and want. Yeah. So, like, I am more likely, at this point in my life, this is not always the way I have been. And you'll notice this about yourself as you grow older. It's sure. like you go through phases where you come, or you'll have an event or, or, or some something occur, you'll pop out the other side completely fucking different than you were before. Absolutely. Not always for the better. Sometimes it's both. And you have, like, I'll just tell you straight up, there is absolutely an element of me that I have carried out of uh, the end of 2019 through 2020 into 2021 that I'm battling that is, it, it revolves around this sort of concept that, like, that I'm a burden and that, that nobody, um, that, I, that nobody around me feels like their life is better as a result of me, but that I make everything more difficult, that it's harder, that I'm a nuisance. And again, the big word being burden. That's a thing that I was I was made to take with me and carry as a result of an experience I went through. Now, that's not something I dealt with at any other point in my life. So when I feel it, I'm very aware of it. It's an acute type of, uh, again, like that sense of self has been damaged. That's a specific feeling. Yeah, I was there before. My freshman year at the University of South Carolina, I've talked about it on the podcast. Yeah. It's kind of the same way. It's a weird feeling of like inadequacy, right? Absolutely. Like um, this, well, it's, so, it's tied to your self-esteem, your self-conscious, your inner, your, your inner you. I feel like a lot of times too, for me, I get a lot of that feeling because with my mental health, a lot of times the only person that can really help it is myself. That's how it feels, anyway. That's how it feels. That's it's how it feels. Wildly inaccurate. And, but and that's my, still the same struggle I have, man. But yeah. in my mind, I'm like, I nobody need, else well, can fix okay. this. It's my brain. Actually, let me put it in a different way. Not the only person that can help me fix it. I'm the only one that knows what I'm going through because I'm the only one that is personally going through it in my mind. So I think that I need to figure it out myself because I'm the only one that is going through it. How could it be anybody else's problem or have anything to do with anybody else if it's in your head, just you alone with it, right? And so if I can't even accurately describe what I'm going through because it's only a feeling within my head, how can I possibly put this onto somebody else when they don't, e they don't even know how to help? They don't know how to, how to deal with it. I so feel I'll like give I'm you the advice. Them. I'll give you the advice that I have found to be to be helpful, yes. and it's that you 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 just hit the nail on the head. Same kind of thought process I go through. Yeah, it's just such an incredibly 
overwhelmingly inaccurate way of looking at things. Most and it's just is. so much overthinking. And like, I'll give you an example. I, all the time I'll tell my girlfriend like, well, I didn't want to tell you that. Or I didn't want to. I didn't want to share this because I didn't want to burden you with it. I didn't want to bother you with it. I didn't want you to. I didn't want you to be your day to somehow be messed up by my situation, my stuff. Sure. And the thing she always says is like, if the shoe was on the other foot, and I t- came to you with that, would it have messed up your day? Would you have felt like I was burdening you? And I'm always like, nah, because I'm not a piece of shit, and I love this woman and care about her very much. Yeah. And then it occurs to me, oh. Oh, that's how it is in a, in a relationship with two people who care about each other and are looking out for each other. Absolutely. So it's, but it doesn't matter that she's done that 20 times. And it's still, it's still a thing I have to think through every single time because, and, and this is, look, it doesn't just apply to, to people who suffer from panic disorder or depression or whatever. It's humans who have been through something. It could be, look, I'm not going to say it could be anything, but there are so many things that could lead to this. Yeah. A sort of, diminished sense of self yeah a beaten down like you feel crushed beneath the weight of your own life version of you right there's like the big most full for each and every one of us there's the big most full powerful and like healthy and fucking i don't even filled up is the word i keep it's like the that tip top version of yourself that you could achieve that you've hopefully all of all of us hopefully have been blessed enough at some point to have felt that your peak self your yeah your best you yeah and then there's like the shriveling, shitty, fucking beaten down, crushed, you, like the, you know what I mean? The thing that you can see and well, feel in your head. For for very driven and creative people, I think a lot of that comes just because we're consistently comparing ourselves to what we want to be or holding ourselves to some higher standard or putting this pressure on ourselves for things that inevitably will probably come with time if we keep doing what we're doing. But we also, I mean... We also live in a society that naturally kind of forces us to feel rushed a lot of times. Like a lot of times it's like, what are you doing next? What are you working on? Where are you going? What's the next step? What's the goal? What's the end game? And you know, this life shouldn't always have goals and end games. Sometimes you just have to do your best to live your best every single day. You know what I mean? Uh, I got a hard disagree with you on that statement just because life without goals and end games. I'm not saying going through like, I'm just saying like. That is hell. I mean. Not these like hard. Se- Don't be afraid to have to adjust and pivot and and like do some along those lines. You know what I mean? Like just because you've had it stuck up in your head what you should be doing your entire life, they're like you should always be reevaluating and and just figuring out like what's next. I just mean like you. Sh- I don't think you should always be like forcing yourselves into these very difficult high set goals. Just more like realistic and 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 easy like attainable goals at a, at a smaller level with like you know the idea in the back of your head of what you want your, your message was just don't shoot for the stars chill out and you'll be all right but i get what you're saying i you mean can't be high intensity high energy chasing the yes. highest hottest dream all the time yes. you need a break sure that's what i mean but in the case of uh asking for help asking for or not even again it could be just telling somebody yo hey, I really need to chill tonight, like, at the apartment by myself. Like, I'm going to need space tonight. I'm going to need me time tonight. If you tell that to somebody who cares about you, loves you, and wants you to be happy, they're going to be like, that's dope, tight. Or they're going to be like, hey, we had that thing planned. You need to remember, or whatever. You know what I'm saying. That's a whole other issue. Manage your fucking schedule. Uh, (laughs) Talking to myself there. Or like, you know, uh, you know, roommate, we haven't been out in so long. I realize it's COVID, but we really need to go out this weekend. I've been cooped up too much i'm losing my mind like sharing those feelings sharing your needs your desires it could be hey man i really want to have fucking pizza tonight and that you carry some weird little voice inside of you that's like you shouldn't have pizza pizza's terrible for you you're gonna get fat and die and it's like maybe if you ate it every fucking day but help yourself to some goddamn pizza life is hard yeah you're getting your ass kicked out here yeah share with somebody let's get some shit to enjoy together yeah like that type of communication can feel very difficult for people who feel small and broken. And I think starting out, you, you hit kind of hit the nail on the head there. Starting out, it's not even like necessarily like asking for help, but just saying what expressing you're going through. Expressing yeah, express, yourself. Yeah, like, hey, I don't know what can help me. I Like, something's going on right now, though, I'm and I just want to make right you now. aware of it. That's yeah. what I'll do. Straight up. Sometimes I'll just say, like, I am really fucked up today. Yeah, I'm and going I, through it right it's now. Not, I don't know what it is all the time when it's happening. It won't be till the next day or the next day after where I can look back and tell my family, my girl, whoever, my friends, 
hey, I was really f- like, I'll be honest, I was really fucked up last week. Yeah. Or like, hey, I'm, I'm, I hit like a that was a, a wall of depression that I didn't really realize I was going through. Now I can look back and see what it was, but I'm, I'm I, you know, I just wanted you to know that's what was going on with yeah. me. Or in some cases, you might have to apologize, but I do want to say that's a, that's a sensitive area. You got to be careful. You don't apologize for being you. You don't apologize for what you were experiencing that is not your fault. That isn't an apology situation. It's just an explanation. You're, uh, you're offering an explanation to the people around you. You don't apologize for you. And that's a terrible habit that I have. Like, it's always, I too. it's always, I have a panic attack. It's always, I'm fucking sorry to everybody about how it impact, like, or a rough week or what. It's just like, dude, nobody else is looking at you like that. It's just you. That's and in your own head. That's where kind of the cyclic, cyclical nature of, you know, the thought of, being a burden kind of comes from you're it's always that, apologize. It's that's yeah. li- it's the, the first little time stuff you have too, it though. That you know? first time you have the thought, yeah. and nobody corrects it, then it's like it's oh, fucking well, over. I Next guess, time, yeah, it's, like you said, well, cyclical. You know, I'm a type of person that overthinks a lot of things. So you know, Me just too. like you said, yeah. it, it, if I say it once and you know nobody has anything to counter that, then it's like oh wow, am I a burden? Like, and a lot of times it's like somebody didn't even hear what I was saying. You know, it's like stupid little shit. They like you. Again, it's just being open with what you're going through. And, you know, and to be clear, to having be clear, those people, many, 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 many mental health patients, people who suffer from the shit that we do or people who have addiction issues or whatever that have impacted their families and friends in negative ways at different points. Like, this is the thing for me. I'll just give you the rundown in 30 seconds. In high school, getting in the trouble that I did made me feel like I had fucked up my family. I made my parents spend tens of thousands of dollars on legal fees. They probably thought I was going to die most days. It had to have scared the shit out of them. I was a total nightmare of a teenager. Um, I'm not going to sit here and like take all the blame. My, 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 I was in a weird situation in life. But I carried that guilt for years, like a decade. I worked through that in therapy in the fucking late I mean, the mid 2010s, bro. Like, that was recent for me. I was a little kid. I was 16, 17, 18 years old when that shit happened. I worked through it at 28. And that's the thing, too. When you're that young, for me, like, looking back on it in hindsight, I realized where a lot of my feelings kind of come from and where they were built up and stuff like that. But for me, like, you don't even realize, especially with mental health and especially as a male in the South, you don't even, a lot of times, you don't even realize what you're going through. Like, for the first year and a half, I struggled with depression. I went to the doctor like five times trying to figure out was ro- what was wrong with me because I thought it was something physical. I thought I had like cancer or something physical. Like, I am dying. Yeah, no, literally. I thought I was dying. I thought something was going on. And, and they never, you know, they did all these different blood tests and everything like that. But it, depression was never talked about. I, I, I thought I called it a funk because I didn't know what else to call it. I just thought I was going through a funk. And uh, until, you know, somebody opens your eyes to kind of what you're going through and what to look for. It's just that constant overthinking. Something's wrong with me. Something's going on. Like, what's what's happening, you know? It can be a very difficult thing to go through as somebody that overthinks because, again, it's that cyclical downward spiral. Make sure your people are aware of what you're going through. That's the most important thing. Nobody, nobody that loves you is going to feel like you are a burden to them, all right? If you need help, you ask for it. If you, if you want pizza tonight, fucking tell somebody. If you want to go out, if you need something, if you have a need, a desire, something that is going to help you to happiness, and you hold that inside, you are doing nothing but hurting you. So today's Monday Mental Health message is to ask for what you need from those around you who love you and care for you. And don't always make what you need. If you ask for something and somebody says, no, go fuck yourself, don't just change your perspective of what you need. That doesn't mean just because that person's not going to give it to you that that, that that's that, that what you wanted was wrong. That's what I'm saying. Oftentimes you will ask people for some shit and you'll find out that person you asked ain't your people. That's how it is sometimes too. But if you need some shit, if you want some shit, y'all express this stuff to, to your people. You are a fucking strong individual human being. You have wants and needs that need to be acknowledged, respected, and acted upon, not just by you but by those around you as well. So get that for you and that will do it for today's show but before you head out to take on the world this time for some very important announcements first and foremost you've been saddled with three legal obligations you heard that right legal obligations as a result of having listened to this entire podcast the first of which rate and review number one legal ob rate and review five stars two three sentences check that box and move on to number two share the show with one person a friend a family member a coworker, a neighbor anybody that you think might enjoy rbp share the show with one person this week that is number two check that box and move on to number three which is to support our sponsors who keep us uh support us and keep us in business felix gray glasses.com slash rbp get there do it now mybookie.ag code rbp do it now and of course black buffalo 
Code CodeRBP for 25% off your first order. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Go support our sponsors who support us and keep us rolling. Get yourself some of the best products known to man. Those are your three legal obligations. If you complete all three, I can call off the dogs. We don't have to see each other in court, and we can all live long and prosper. We have social media. If you're a social media person and you're interested in following us on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, we have those. Instagram, at the Ross Boland Podcast. Twitter, at Ross Boland Pod. Facebook.com slash Ross Boland Podcast. We can't post there. I wouldn't recommend liking us. Uh, we've been banned. We're not sure why. Shadow ban. Zuckerberg, suck my cock. Follow me, Ross Boland, on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at W-R-B-O-L-E-N on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And Coles and I are live a few times a week on twitch.tv slash boss Roland. Twitch.tv slash boss Roland. Christopher, where can everybody follow you on social media? You can find me on Instagram at ChrisSC99. You can find me on Twitter at Q0ULS. You can find me on Snapchat at Chris underscore Colson. That's C-O-U-L-S-O-N. Check out Bolin Media's television and film podcast, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, available wherever you listen to RBP. If you love TV and movies, you will love OCC, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, Bolin Media's television and film podcast, hosted by me, Ross Bolin, and my dear friend of 17 years, Mr. Barrett Dudley. OCC, Oysters, Clams, Cockles. That will do it for RBP 368, produced by Mike Moody Garcia of Permanent Record Studios in Austin, Texas. Coles and I will be back on Wednesday for episode 369, nice, right here on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, nice. and YouTube.com slash Bowling Media. Then, of course, we'll be back Friday on Patreon with another ad-free premium edition of the Ross Bowling Podcast. Start 2021 supporting the show, getting those ad-free Friday episodes for just 5 bucks a month as a minimum pledge to back the show on Patreon.com slash Ross Bowling Podcast. Keep in mind, never forget, you are are not alone. Podmen get paid. Respect Mr. Park. Strength and honor. Gang, gang, gang. Christopher, peace be with you. And also with you.